So if I invited you, and I, you can certainly turn to the, the book of James, and if you were open up uh, the book of James toward the end of the Bible and begin to read there the very first chapter, the second verse, uh, we, we would find that, that James utters this real paradox for us. He says, count it all joy when you meet trials of various kinds. Now think about that. He's saying, be joyful, rejoice when you encounter hardships or trials or tribulations. And when I hear that, and I'm certain when you hear that, uh, on the surface, it seems just utterly ridiculous, right? And yet, when we look at this truth statement by James in the context of, of this gospel text that I just read, uh, what we will discover is that what James is uttering is really a, a, a great truth. And so let's let's kind of settle ourselves into that scene from the gospel with this in the backdrop, right? Well, James' words. In the gospel of John chapter 16, where we find ourselves, the scene is Maundy Thursday, okay? It's the night before Jesus is going to the cross, Jesus is gathered with his disciples in this upper room, and it has been an incredibly long night when we get to this section in chapter 16. It's been an incredibly long night with a lot of things that Jesus has said and did uh, that it's probably more than the disciples could have truly absorbed uh, the amount of material that, that they were experiencing that night. And just before Jesus ends all of the things that he's saying and he's teaching them, and before he goes into a moment of prayer, he says to them these words that I read just a minute ago. I won't read the whole thing, but he says, A little while, and you will see me no longer. And again, a little while, and you will see me. Truly, truly, I say to you, you will weep and you will lament, but the world will rejoice. You will be sorrowful but your sorrow will turn into joy. So you have sorrow now, but I will see you again, and your hearts will rejoice, and no one will be able to take your joy from me. Until now, you've asked nothing in my name. Ask, and you will receive that your joy may be full. And so here's what I want us to do. I want to invite you and I together to consider what it must have been like for the Apostle John to write this section of the gospel, to write this very gospel that we have, the gospel of John, and specifically what he thought and he felt as he wrote those words from Jesus uh, on that very dramatic evening that we just heard. Now, a little backdrop on John, just so you know who he is. John is what we would call He's called the beloved disciple. He's one of the inner three for Jesus. In fact, we might even say that it's possible that John knew Jesus better than almost anyone else. And what's really clear as we read his gospel is that the events of Holy Week had a huge impact on him as he dedicates more than a third of the entire book just to the events of Holy Week. And even more so than that, those events of Holy Week, he actually spends more than half of that, that portion focused on the events of Maundy Thursday and that evening in the upper room with Jesus. And so it, it had tremendous impact on him. Now, as we consider what it was like for John to write about that moment, I think it's also important for us to realize that John wrote and he rewrote this particular gospel over a 50-year period of time. Uh, the evidence that we have shows that he wrote uh, the first draft just a, a few years uh, after Jesus' ascension, and then uh, around 50 A.D., he reworked it again, and then in 85 A.D., once again, to give us the full uh, gospel text that we have today. And here's what I think. I imagine each time that he reworked that gospel message, the Holy Spirit allowed him to experience those moments with Jesus 
uh, once again. And as he did uh, experience those moments with Jesus, uh, he was also very mindful of the the 50 years of life ev- events that he had experienced uh, post-Jesus uh, ascension. And so he was probably, as, as he was writing this gospel, he was uh, viewing all of his life through the lens of that gospel that he wrote, specifically the words of Jesus uh, on that Thursday evening. Um, so for John, it seems clear that uh, 50 years after that evening in the upper room with Jesus on Monday, Thursday, one of the things that, that stuck to him was uh, Jesus was leaving. Jesus was leaving. Uh, John points this out more than 17 times in this entire uh, section of the gospel, uh, referencing Jesus talking about a little while and you'll see me no more, or where I'm going, you cannot come, I'm going to the Father, or my time has come. Over 17 times he makes these references that Jesus is leaving. And this was huge for John. John had been with Jesus for more than three years. He lived with him. He followed him. He loved him. He did all of life with Jesus during this time period. Jesus was his teacher. Jesus was his Lord. Jesus was his Savior. Jesus was his friend. And now, Jesus is leaving. Can you imagine how sorrowful and impactful that was? John tells us, that in that moment, his heart was filled with sorrow. Sorrow is this internal grief and pain that we experience from some external outcome or cause. Okay? It's what we experience when we suffer loss. Now consider, consider John, you know, 85-year-old John, reliving this moment as he writes. We have to wonder if he thought about all the sorrow that he had experienced over those 50 years of living without Jesus. Because we look at the book of Acts and we read his epistles and we know full well through the history uh, what John endured. He endured many moments of imprisonment. He endured many moments of torture. He endured many moments of being isolated and imprisoned, especially the one specific moment where he was isolated and imprisoned on the island of Patmos after being boiled and burned. And what about the fact that he was the last living disciple? How many decades had he lived as the only disciple of Jesus who was left? All of his other friends, all of the other disciples dead and gone, which probably also reminded him of just how long he had been apart from Jesus as well. And all of that reality had to constantly fill John's heart with grief and with sorrow. But then, listen as he writes, as he writes and he remembers one of Jesus' final words to him and to the disciples. In that moment, think about what it must have been like for him to experience once again as he wrote, Truly, truly, I say to you, you will leap, weep, and lament. The world will rejoice. You'll be sorrowful, but your sorrow will be turned into joy. He says, You have sorrow now. Think of John writing, but I'll see you again, and your hearts will rejoice, and no one will take that joy from you. What John must have been thinking and experiencing when he wrote those words anew in his old age. Your sorrow will turn to joy and nothing will take that joy away. I mean, sure, he had experienced a level of sorrow that few can comprehend. But joy, joy was John's forever. Joy that that Jesus' words were true to be reminded of that reality again a little while and you will see me no more. He re- remembered the cross. It what it did happen. Happened just a few hours after Jesus uttered those words. Jesus would sacrifice himself for the sin of the world, but a little while and you will see me and you will rejoice. As John writes it, he's reminded. 
He's taken back to that first Easter Sunday, seeing Jesus alive, seeing Jesus glorified, seeing Jesus as Lord of Lords and King of Kings, his friend again, alive and glorified, brought joy. Joy because of grace. Joy because of the G, that, that he John had the privilege of suffering in the name of Jesus. He tells us that in Acts. We see it as he suffers for Jesus and he and he rejoices at the opportunity to suffer for the sake of Jesus. Joy in John's heart because he got to share in the gospel with Jesus. And joy because of that he got to share the gospel with countless lives who were also eternally changed by God's grace. For John, the words of his good friend James rang true. Count it all joy when you meet trials of various kinds, for you know that the testing of your faith produces steadfastness. Joy comes from the confidence of knowing that no matter what trials this world throws at us, God is present, he's at work, and he has already declared how the story ends. Nothing can separate us from his love and his life. And that's why, even in the midst of trials and tribulations and sorrow and grief, for John, joy is still present. Here's the thing. What if we turn back to that gospel message there in in John 16, and we looked at this moment differently? What if we dove into this moment as it was happening and listened to Jesus from his own perspective and what he was feeling and experiencing and thinking as he was saying these very words, and he talked about sorrow on that first Thursday evening? Now, obviously, Jesus knew that the, to- the torture that he was about to endure. He knew that he was going to be brutally tortured, that he was going to hang on a cross and he was going to die. That's sorrow. And he knew that in that moment, he would be utterly alone as he hung there on the cross, bearing the full sin of the world. That's sorrow. He knew that he would be abandoned by all of his disciples. He told them, you're going to scatter and you're going to leave me alone. And he probably also knew that in that final moment, as he was taking his last breath, bearing the sin of the world and being sin in that moment, that he would also be abandoned by his father. And that reality, as Jesus was preparing his disciples, had to have filled his own heart with extreme grief and sorrow. And yet, there's no doubt that the words of James rang true for Jesus in that moment as well. Count it all joy when you meet trials of various kinds. I mean, Jesus, enduring the trial of the cross, gave his heart joy knowing that his sacrificial death led to forgiveness and new life for all of humanity. That was his joy. And it's a joy that he means for us to have and experience as well. And so speaking of us, let's look at it for a moment and experience this moment from our own perspectives. As we consider this this moment in in, in the upper room and Jesus' words of sorrow, what is it? What is our perspective as we read it? especially in light of John's perspective and and Jesus' perspective. How do we experience these words from our own perspective? I think it's safe to say that we all know the experience of sorrow and grief and loss. I, I shared my own experience earlier. But what about this? What, what about a single mom who learns that the company she has worked for for the last five years is, is closing its doors and she's now out of work? Talk about grief and loss. Talk about sorrow. What about parents hearing the news that their newborn baby has a severe heart defect, as I shared, and the road ahead is going to be hard and filled with uncertainty? Talk about grief and lor- sorrow and loss. What about your last living parent has gone into hospice care 
and it's time to now say goodbye. Talk about loss and grief. Talk about sorrow. We live in a community, or we, the fact that sometimes we do, we live in a community that belittles us for believing in Jesus, leaving us often f- feeling isolated and having no support around us. There's grief and there's loss in that. There's great sorrow. In the midst of the trials and the sorrow that this world throws at us and that we experience, we hear John and we hear James count it all joy when you meet trials of various kinds. For you know that the testing of your faith produces steadfastness. Joy is this. I want to define it for us just so we understand. Joy is delight in the awareness of God's love and His grace for us. That's Christian joy. Joy is experienced when one who is wrecked with guilt and shame hears the Father in heaven say to us, I love you so much that I gave my only Son that if you believe in Him, you shall not perish, but you will have eternal life. You are forgiven. You are you're filled with grace and love and mercy and life. That sorrow turning to joy. The good news that, that God has delivered us from the domain of, of darkness and transferred us to the kingdom of his beloved son in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. That is sorrow turning to joy at the good news of Jesus. That's what moved Jesus from sorrow to joy. It's what moved James. It's what moved John from sorrow to joy. So joy is what we experience when God enables us to find delight in Him and Him alone, regardless of the circumstances of our lives, because we're aware that He's at work in our lives, and that He has a tangible purpose for the the trials and the tribulations and the sorrow and the grief that we might be experiencing. And when we ex- experience the, the glimpses, we get to experience the glimpses of something greater that God has designed for us. The hope of the eternal kingdom that is to come. And that is what moves us from sorrow to joy. So I'm going to leave you with this, this challenge, okay? in light of everything that we've, we've kind of learned and talked about today. As you consider the trials and tribulations of your life that, that bring sorrow and grief into your hearts, what are two things that you can do to delight in the awareness of God's presence and His love and His grace for you? I'll say it one more time. As you consider the trials, the tribulations of your life that bring sorrow and grief, what are two things that you can do to delight in the awareness of God's presence, His love, and His grace that is so real for you? And I'll leave you with this. May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing so that by the power of the Holy Spirit, you may abound in hope. Amen.